Do not attempt to adjust the antenna on your monitor. I'm currently experiencing some technical difficulties with my camera, so please bear with me. Hello and welcome to another edition of the Dinosaur News Center. We bring you the latest in research, discoveries, and other news relating to the world of dinosaurs. I'm your semi-animated host, the Illiterate Scholar. Our top stories today, Dinosaur Survivors and a New Method to Measure Time, a Massive New Tyrannosaur in China, and for once we actually have some entertainment news. Well, those poor Spinosaurs are rather unlucky. A new member has just been found, and this is all we have. This is Oxalia Coulombensis of Late Cretaceous Brazil. As you can see, we've recovered very little of this dinosaur. We don't even know what the heck it looks like. If it had a third leg growing out of its butt, we wouldn't know. Ah, but that doesn't stop artists from drawing pictures of it. Take anything you see with a huge grain of salt. Especially when they draw the nostrils in the wrong position. Dinosaurs didn't go completely extinct for another 700,000 years after the Great Extinction. At least not all of them, according to a new method in dating fossils. This new method is called UPB dating, and it could revolutionize paleontology as a whole. UPB stands for uranium lead dating. There's just one little problem. There's no way to tell when the uranium entered the bones. So the supposed dinosaurs that lived 700,000 years after the extinction could have died 2 million years earlier. And let's say the uranium seeped into the bones 700,000 years after the extinction event. So what you'd end up doing is measuring when the uranium seeped into the bones, not when the animal died. Hopefully more research is done to perfect this method. The life of a rebel, always living on the edge. When they tell you to go left, you go right. When they tell you to walk forward, you walk backwards. When others evolve into advanced vicious carnivores, you become a bug-eyed, buck-toothed carnivore with primitive features. That's the case with Demonosaurus, a late Triassic carnivore from Ghost Ranch, New Mexico. The same place that's famous for the discovery of hundreds of Coelophysis fossils. Even though it came later, Demonosaurus exhibits features from more primitive dinosaurs. So far, all we have is the skull, but paleontologists aren't entirely sure if Demonosaurus is an adult or juvenile. Being a juvenile could also explain why the animal looks more primitive. Hey, you remember that unnamed Tyrannosaur I mentioned in an episode a few months ago? This Tyrannosaur is called Teratophanus curry from Late Cretaceous, Utah. But wait, there's still another Tyrannosaur discovery, but it hasn't been officially published yet. Well, this has absolutely nothing to do with that. What I have for you today is a massive new Tyrannosaur from China named Juchang Tyrannus Magnus. Based on what was found, this Tyrannosaur was about 11 meters long. That would make it the third biggest species of Tyrannosaur. Professor David Hone speculated that Jutang Tyrannus lived close enough in both time and distance that it might have ran into Tarbrosaurus. The bones identified as Jutang Tyrannus has enough distinct features to be a different genus from other Asian Tyrannosaurs. But get this, Jutang Tyrannus was also discovered mixed together with bones of another unnamed Tyrannosaur. There might be more bones in that jumble that belongs to Jutang Tyrannus, but that needs to be sorted out first. I tried to pry some information on the second specimen from Professor Hone, but he was immune to my interrogation techniques. So until information on this specimen is published, there's nothing I can do. Extinct! <laughs> and how, pray tell, did that happen? I don't know, it was the Ice Age. Glaciers moved, it got cold, it was snowing and stuff. Oh, really? And I suppose it never occurred to us to put on coats! He's got you there. That may not be so far from the truth. Recent studies of the northeast region of China shows that it had pretty harsh winters. Many of the dinosaur fossils found in that deposit were covered with feathers or proto-feathers. The feathers may have kept the dinosaurs warm, but that also meant they had to deal with lice. In fact, dinosaur feathers may have led to the evolution of lice, says biologists. And yes, Lice is not exclusive to mammals. Birds also have lice. Wow, that's like reading the will of your dead great-great-great-grandpa, only to find out you're inheriting his lice. I love the special effects wizards. They make the impossible come to life on screen. Heck, I've wanted to be a special effects guy as a kid. I've been perfecting my skills all these years. Look what I can do. 
I just magically changed my shirt. Now I'll change back. Pretty damn good, huh? But you know who's even better? Phil Tippett. He recently released an HD remastered version of his 1984 short film Prehistoric Beast for all to see on YouTube. Go check it out. Despite its age, it holds up surprisingly well. The design of the dinosaurs are based on more modern thinking, and my only criticism is that the tip of the Tyrannosaur mandible looks a little awkward. No word on whether he'll remaster the rest of the scenes from the dinosaur special. For those of you with Steam and a copy of Half-Life 2, a new mod was released last month called Dino D-Day. The game takes place in the very underused setting of World War II, and it's also an FPS game. A very rare combination indeed. Chances are, I won't be reviewing this game. It's not exactly getting glowing reviews everywhere. Okay, to be fair, I'm just sick of FPS games in general. So the mediocre reviews only fuel my apathy for this game. If the concept of punching Nazi dinosaurs in the face sounds appealing to you, then check it out. It has a sense of humor. You can also play as a dinosaur. In another bit of game-related news, developer Telltale has announced a delay to their Jurassic Park adventure game. I must applaud Telltale for taking the time to polish their game to make it even better. Judging from what I've seen, I'd say they need another, oh, say... 65 million years to make this garbage look good. But no, they're only pushing it back to this fall. Shut up, shut up, shut up! And that's all the news we have for today. So let's move on to our next segment and profile today's dinosaur. I wonder how many people by now have figured out that this is stock footage. So let me introduce you to Shangtungosaurus giganteus, a hadrosaur from late Cretaceous China. It looks and shares many features with Atmontosaurus. Think of it as a Chinese bootleg Atmontosaurus. Except this bootleg is a lot bigger. The biggest specimen is over 16 meters. This makes it the largest hadrosaur and ornithischian. Only the sauropods are bigger. Now Shangtungosaurus is named after the province of Shangtung, and within this province is a city named Juchang. Yes, that's the city of Juchang Tyrannus. These two definitely lived in the same time range. Chances are, this animal's large size is its only defense against this predator. Alright, it's time for some mail. Let's see what kind of questions we have for today. Huey Lewis asks, What do you think of Gorosaurus? Eh, I'm not too impressed. He doesn't even have any cool powers. And he gets his ass kicked by that! Well, he does have this kangaroo kick. This is how a pro does it. Alex asks, Could you recommend some good research material in order to get my foot in the door when it comes to learning about dinosaurs? Normally, I'd recommend reading books, but paleontology moves so fast that they get outdated pretty quickly. For a beginner, Wikipedia's dinosaur list is a good place to start. Just remember you're reading Wikipedia. Otherwise, it's not too bad to learn the basics there. When you feel like you have a good grasp of things, try reading the scientific papers that are released online. There's also a dinosaur mailing list on the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. I'll give you a link at the end of the show. There's also this guy online, um, what was his name? Um, oh, the Illiterate Scholar. He has a show online called Dinosaur News Center. I hear he's pretty good. And that about wraps it up for this edition of the Dinosaur News Center. If you have any questions you want me to answer on this show, use this email below. Until next time, this is the Illiterate Scholar signing off.